welcome to Future Talk. The world is facing some pretty big problems these days, and some people aren't willing to sit back and hope that somebody else will come up with the solutions. There are lots of grassroots groups seeking new approaches to dealing with today's major issues, and some of them are right here in Silicon Valley. My guests today represent two of these groups. Sam Hahn is one of the co-founders of Program for the Future, which is based on the ideas of the late Silicon Valley pioneer Doug Engelbart. Their mission is to find new ways to leverage our collective intelligence and improve our collaboration with each other in order to solve big problems more effectively. Maylin Fung is co-founder of Franchise for Humanity and believes that social innovation is the key to harnessing technology for the good of humanity. She was one of the pioneers of customer relationship management. A bit later in the program, we'll show some video taken at a recent Franchise for Humanity conference at Stanford University. But let's start with Program for the Future. Sam, exactly what are you trying to accomplish with Program for the Future? So Program for the Future is intended to further the collaboration and collective intelligence vision of Doug Engelbart. Doug, when he was 25, basically decided to look at how he could most effectively provide the planet and civilization with tools that could help us address very large planetary scale problems. Now when you talk about collective intelligence, what does that mean? Is that just using the intelligence we already have more efficiently or are we talking about some new type of intelligence? So the definition I like to use is intelligence is a way that you can actually achieve a goal or solve a problem. And so when you apply it collectively, you want to make sure that the problem or the goal that you attain is qualitatively better than any proper subset of the people that are actually involved. So you really want to make sure that the team itself provides an optimum, however you define optimum, solution to a problem. So how do you do that? Does that mean like you're brainstorming and everybody is contributing their ideas and the best ideas come to the surface? No, because um, the common notions of collective intelligence uh, are very simple and we cannot just say, oh, well, you know, we're going to listen to everyone and assume that we're going to come up with the best solution. The best solution has to be evaluated on its own terms, whether or not you've got a fixed set of metrics or whether you've got some, you know, checklist of items that you're actually going to verify for a given solution. And so it's not as simple as just having everyone speak their mind and be heard. Is there some specific problem that you're focusing on? Um, actually, the way Doug was going about this problem is not by saying he wants to focus on a specific problem. He can see a whole litany of problems. You know, if you look at the um, Millennium Project, they've already cataloged at least 16 or 17 of these problems from hunger to water, quality to overpopulation. So many problems have already been inventoried and cataloged and we're already aware of what they are. What Doug was trying to do is say, for us to make reasonable progress on any of those problems, we have to be able to find out how we can work together better. So rather than specifically zoning in on one problem, he was saying, what are the nature of the collaborations that we need to actually achieve? So he's looking at how we manage information, how we manage plans, how we look at agreement, how we look at alignment, how we look at, you know, just remote uh, collaboration as well. So all of that plays and all of those things are how we want to be leveraging some technology, not just in a particular problem. So you're basically talking about creating a process which can be uh, applied to any problem. You could say that. Uh, it's a process as well as a set of tools. Because once you have a process, you want to then optimize pieces of that process. And technology usually comes in and helps you optimize some aspect of it. And what do you actually do in Program for the Future? How do you know if you're making any progress toward your goals? So Program for the Future is a very long-term uh, perspective. The first of our events held in 2008, in which uh, Mei Lin was uh, also an organizer, key organizer, was just to say, of the vision that Doug really set out to attain, how much have we actually come, you know, how, how far have we actually come, okay? So it's actually a, a nice anecdote I have from that conference now that when I asked Doug this very question, he flippantly but almost seriously said, we've gone almost 3.6% of the way towards the vision that he actually set out for himself when he was 25 years old. When he, when he talked about a vision, what was his vision? Was it just to define a process for solving problems, or was he talking about a vision in which problems were solved? Um, so I can say uh, 
there's actually both uh, involved in what his vision is, because his vision was not just to come up with a theory or a model. It was actually to practice that theory, to build the tools, collect the teams, and then actually then evolve those tools, but not just the tools themselves. It was to evolve the way we use those tools and the way our beliefs, our values, our practices, procedures, protocols, contracts, communication styles, all have to keep up with the advances in technology. Okay? See, if we don't change ourselves, then technology grows by leaps and bounds, but we're still operating on perhaps hundreds of years old uh, methods and practices. Well, you mentioned values. Are there people involved in Program for the Future sharing some type of common values which enables them to work together? Because Doug represented a very lengthy, let's say, you know, he was working for several decades on this. We've picked out in Program for the Future eight key principles out of Doug's work that really drive uh, Program for the Future. They involve approaching problems in a bootstrapping way. That's principle. That's one of the principles. What does that and mean? And by bootstrapping, it really means that every iteration, every attempt to solve uh, a problem, is almost by necessity imperfect. But what's important is that you keep new iterations. You keep trying new things, and that you learn from each iteration, and that you apply that learning back to what you're actually doing uh, initially. So, today. The common word for that is agile. You know, if you are in the software development business, uh, agile principles um, embody those those practices. But Doug was doing this way back in the early '60s. Now, what does Program for the Future actually do? Do you have projects that you're working on that you have meetings and you check how you're doing on them, or do you get together and discuss philosophical principles? What is the actual effort going on in the group? Okay. So right now, and there are multiple threads going on, but one of the key threads that's most easy to grasp is that 2018 would be 50 years after the first uh, demonstration that Doug showed of his hypertext, his uh, word processing, his outline processing, his mouse technologies. So we're thinking in 50 years after Doug showed his first demo, what could we do? We being those of us involved in Program for the Future and those that we would like to recruit to come work with us. What kind of a demonstration could we create between now and 2018, given that we have five years to do this, that would then show the world new, fabulous ways that technology can be employed, can be leveraged, that would then be the seed for another three or four decades of innovation beyond 2018? How big is this group? Do you have many members, or uh, how, do, how do you judge how it's doing? Okay, so right now it is a small group. Right now we have on the order of about a dozen people that are working on this, uh, some very, very seriously, you know, meeting every week, some peripherally and just uh, providing support. So what we're doing is uh, coming up with a plan for not only the structure for this challenge, but specific um, innovations that we would like to pursue. One of our uh, members, um, Alan, is actually positing that we do something as ambitious as space travel, as a challenge. Okay, now, it sounds very, very challenging, but you know, if you then take a look at what NASA is doing, NASA is already involved in some of that, but he's just taking that idea and going one, one step further and saying, how could we use that motivating project as a way to showcase how we collaborate, how we recruit people internationally, how we then bring in multidisciplinary um, efforts together, and then show that we can actually produce something um, in 2018. So that's okay, one of our good. examples. And we're going to continue this conversation in a little bit, but now I'd like to turn to Mei Lin Fung. And you are one of the co-founders of Franchise for Humanity. Mm -hmm. I understand there are some similarities between Franchise for Humanity and Program for the Future, but what is the main thrust of your organization? So Franchise for Humanity came out of my work from with customer relationship management. In 1988-89, many years ago, um, we used technology and we redefined the way sales and marketing was done. But what I, what I had hoped for, which would be a relationship enhancing technology, ended up being a way in which businesses could control their customers and sort of went off in a different direction than I ever expected. That's when I realized it was really important to have the social innovation within our social institutions and our social processes so that we could take this technology and use it to enhance our humanity and not just make more money, get more revenue out of a single customer. 
So Franchise for Humanity is really saying that we as people have to decide what is it that we want. This technology is wonderful, but it's like fire. This is something that Doug Engelbart said. He said, technology is like fire. It can burn you up or you can harness it. We have to decide what we want to do with our humanity. Where should we, what should our families be like? What will our schools be like? What do we want our children's lives to be like? We need to decide that now because we have a most incredible tool that connects us and helps us communicate to people around the world and that has never happened before. Now does so, Franchise for Humanity have a specific vision of the way you want those things to be? Franchise for Humanity respects the individual. So we want to catalyze human potential so that people can be all that they can be. That respect and dig dignity of the individual is paramount. And somehow that has got lost as we've looked at technology and thought, oh, what neat and cool thing can we do? So Doug Engelbart talked about the coevolution of the human and the tool system. And we've had terrific innovations in the tools, but now we have to evolve our social infrastructure, our social institutions, so that we can harvest the benefits of those tools for the things that are most meaningful and important to us as humans. Last night I was at a conference put together by the Churchill Club about the future of work. And it was, it was very rational, and, and I stood up at the end of it and I said, we have not heard a single thing about families, about compassion, about nurturing, about what we want our children's lives to be like. And that theme was taken up by other co speakers through the conference. Now, are you talking about changing people's behavior, or are you talking about changing the institutions, or both? I think when we, as a society, get into a place of great disruption, we don't know where, where's up and what's down, we need to center ourselves. We need to decide and remember what's important to us. In a way, we've been so disrupted by the um, promise of technology. It seems like, oh, let's press another button. Let's try another gadget. But what is it all about? Do we care about how our parents' lives are? Do we care about aging? Do we care about the quality of life? Are we paying the right attention to that? Can, well, that's what I saw with customer relationship management. It was supposed to be about relationships. It ended up being customer service representatives being told, do not spend more than two minutes on each person. And the, the technology was there to control that that would happen. And so people became very dissatisfied. They lost human intimacy. They lost human touch. They said, why am I doing business with this company that I hate doing business with? It, it becomes very frustrating. So I've seen how it goes off the rails, and I think it's very, very important that we speak up. Particularly, I think the answer is in plain sight. We talk about the evolution of our social institutions. How is that going to happen? Oh, my goodness. You know, who's going to change it? The answer is right there. There are women. There are families, there are children, there are people who care about the future. Let's mobilize them, let's empower them, let's engage them. That's what Franchise for Humanity is about. Okay, very good, and we're going to get back to that subject. But first, we have some video from your recent Franchise for Humanity conference at Stanford University. We have some interviews with some of the attendees. So let's go ahead and roll that tape. Basically, uh a sustainability project and it's about how can we make a sustainable version of liquid fuel how can we increase our available freshwater supplies how can we make local food supplies and how can we do all of this without damaging the environment and I've been working on a solution to that problem at least for coastal cities uh, for these last six years and what does that solution look like so far so the solution we call Omega it stands for Offshore Membrane Enclosures for Growing Algae. Um, it turns out microalgae are an incredibly good source of liquid fuel. They, you, algae make lots of oil. In fact, 90% of the fossil oil we currently get from the deep earth or under the ocean comes from microalgae. And these microalgae not only make oil, usable oil, but they can grow on wastewater. So we can grow them on sewage from our cities. So we can grow the algae on wastewater, 
And there are freshwater algae growing in these containers as we envision the Omega system floating offshore. So we're not using land, we're not using water, we're not using fertilizers, we're not competing with agriculture to make a biofuel. So algae basically turns into something like oil that can burn? Exactly. You can make the algae, um, you can process this algae biomass into a fuel and the algae not only took wastewater and grew on the nutrients in the wastewater, but they took carbon from the atmosphere to grow because they're photosynthesis. Photos, they're doing photosynthesis, so they use carbon dioxide. That's a greenhouse gas. So they capture carbon, they clean the wastewater, and they're freshwater algae living in a marine environment. So if they escape into the environment, they die. So they can't damage the environment. I, I am hoping that I'll make connections here with people who can reach out into the world and help to develop this technology. I mean, I'm a scientist, and I've been thinking about how to technically solve the problem. There are a lot of social hurdles that need to be overcome. How do you get people to take on this new challenge? Um, people are not behaving as though they really see the crisis that is coming. Right now, the reason I think social innovation is taking off so well is that we, we really have a perfect storm of demographics. We have the baby boomers who are entering what a lot of people call the purpose years of their lives. They've made their mark in the world, they've made their money. They want to know what's my purpose, what legacy am I leaving behind? And so they are actually transitioning in a lot of cases to running nonprofits, uh, serving in public service. And so we see that big movement happening. In conjunction with that, you've got the millennials who are their own unique group of people, uh, born after 1982. And this group, uh, Deloitte just published a great study on millennials, and they talk about the fact that this group is, is very in tune to purpose, to that businesses need to be providing social value, not just profit, and they're going to be pushing from within organizations to make that happen. Uh, the Nature Conservancy is, is an organization that I just greatly admire. Uh, they have they won three Edison Awards last year for some of their incredible innovations along the lines of self self perpetuating systems. They created a water trust fund. I can't remember if it's Brazil or Colombia, um, where they are actually have the utility company, the largest Coca Cola bottling company, the government, and the ranchers all working together to to manage the use of the water. So everyone wins. The ranchers are being paid not to graze certain areas so that the watershed is protected. And in return, the utility company is saving money on some of the recovery fees they would have normally had to for the wastewater treatment. And the government's winning because they don't have to, you know, it's, it's, it's basically creating a, a, an ecosystem that is paying for itself. So after the initial infusion of money to create this fund, it now becomes a self-perpetuating system. Well, ever since I was, oh, maybe 30 years old, I had this crazy dream to transform the planet for the better. But I thought, how ridiculous is that? And now here we are with a real opportunity to do exactly that. And what sort of transformation do you think is required? Well, I was hoping that the governments would sort things out, but failing that, I've been looking to global businesses. I've been supporting Japanese globalizing businesses and solving global problems profitably and sustainably and helping them learn to work together as they expand overseas and include diverse members in their teams. What do you think the big problems are that need to be solved? Mostly pretty simple. Like uh, human beings need to trust each other. They need to learn to communicate, hammer out some shared goals that bring them together and realize that they're not going to get where they want to go unless they help each other. I, I know almost no companies now that think they're just in business to make a profit. All of them feel they have some purpose beyond profit. And maybe it's just corporate hype, but I have to believe that it's authentic, otherwise I can't get out of bed in the morning. Now with all your clients, what, what do you actually do? How, what do you offer to those clients? What, what business are you in? I do what I call work shocks team effectiveness, global leadership, creativity and innovation work shocks to shock people into waking up to what's possible and to doing what seems impossible but is merely difficult through the power of the group genius. And I have my seven, my seven favorite things I'd like everyone on earth to have. Clean drinking water, healthy food, education, health care, uh, clean sustainable power, and uh, access to sanitary toilets and, well, I forget what the seventh one, how about some fun to enjoy their lives. Yeah. Well, that was our video of the Franchise for Humanity at Stanford University, and that was fun interviewing all those people. But let me ask you this. Do you feel that the conference achieved its purpose? Did you get what you hoped to out of it? Yes, the people who met each other there, 
not only that um, we have these wonderful presenters, but we all sat around the table and tried to help each other. We have now since then instituted the next Tuesday call so that every Tuesday at 10 a.m., all of the people that you just saw and the bunch of people who attended come into a one phone call where we report on the projects that we're doing. And somebody says, oh yeah, I can help with that. And, and so we've got Stan Gould who has now put a whole group of people and he's helping o Jonathan Trent with Omega, this very promising biofuel opportunity. Um, Sandy Bates has invited a whole bunch of us to attend the Edison Awards so there'll be a Franchise for Humanity contingent. All of this came about because the idea of iteration, Sam talked about, you got to keep doing it, you got to keep doing it. Um, Kimberly talked about trust and communication. This doesn't happen with one conference. By the next Tuesday calls, since that conference in February 21st, we've had eight conference calls. It's been eight weeks. We've just kept going. And people are excited about it. I just got some, uh, a note yesterday from somebody who said hugs in his email because the whole thing is now, he would never have said that. I only just met him for the first time at the conference. But now we're having these calls every week. People are getting a sense of each other, where they're coming from, what they stick with. We're getting to know each other. We're beginning to do things. This can make a difference. I came to this idea of the next Tuesday call because of Engelbart's ideas about networked improvement communities. That informed people within the Department of Health and Human Services. I was asked by the US Department of Defense to join their effort to look at the future of health in order to bring Doug's ideas about networked improvement communities. The Franchise for Humanity is the distillation of five years of work that I did with the Department of Defense where he looked at the future of health. And what we came down to was simple. It's just like Kimberly said. We have to look at health as communities. We have to decide, let each community decide what is it that they consider important and help them take the lead in that. We look at the Affordable Care Act and think, why hasn't President Obama done this and that and the other? Health cannot happen top down. President Obama cannot make you healthy. You, we have to make ourselves healthy. When we take that challenge, we can do something with it. Franchise for Humanity is empowering people to, to realize, let's not wait for the government. The government can help. The government has helped a lot by providing the internet. But now it's up to us to define what kind of communities we want to live in, what kind of lives we want to live. Now, what are your aspirations for Franchise for Humanity? Where do you want it to be in, say, you know, three years from now? I see us continuing the effort to spread the word about this way of working. So a, a university in China has already said, can we have a chapter of Franchise for Humanity? The folks who came attended from Nigeria want to have a chapter there. The people who came from Brazil they're working with Sandy Bates, and they're, they're doing things, and they'd like to have a Franchise for Humanity chapter in Brazil. Well, it sounds like both of your organizations could be replicated, and maybe uh, either one of you could answer this. If other groups spring up uh, imitating some of your ideas, I, mean, I, I assume that's perfectly OK. And are you looking for a network or just groups even just working alone, accomplishing something? I think Mayla mentioned this network of uh, improvement communities and that you know when you connect these networks together, you get this leveraging effect. You get this compound interest effect of impact. And that's what really you know, we're trying to achieve. Let me describe it a different way. When you have many, many experiments going on, it's not surprising if you have thousands of experiments, one or two really succeed. What's important is to keep track of all 1,000, find the ones that succeed and have them replicate. That is really what has happened within the US Federal Department of Health and Human Services. They have 9,000 community health centers. They look for what they call positive deviants, those positive exemplars who, against the odds, did something good. Those, those were then identified as the gold standard. And the gold standard, to maintain that, they had to write a toolkit, a template, to help every, every other community health center attain that same standard. Now, do you have ever any difficulties when you're dealing with people from very different cultures? If you're dealing with people from the same culture, communication is a little easier. But people who have had 
vastly different life experiences, dealt, dealt with different problems. Are you trying to network with people in those cultures as well? And how does that work out? Sam? So that actually addresses one of the other uh, principles that are behind Program for the Future. Uh, we're trying to come up with what is not a centrally controlled mechanism for making impact, but we're trying to come up with what is that key genome of behavior, of conduct, of values, that if you just drop leaflets you know, all over the entire world, you know, people would, in, would individually align themselves with these kind of things, okay? So in the uh, Community of Impact, which is one of the efforts coming out of Program for the Future, we're trying to just get a few practices that we would like to spread. And these practices help people become accountable to themselves and become transparent to their colleagues. And what we really mean by that is talk about what you want to do, talk about how you want to do it, but have very close, very trusted colleagues who can actually hold you accountable to your own execution and to your own values, your own communication, your own uh, compensation, your own measure measurement of your effects. So, so let me jump in yeah. because you asked a specific question about how do you deal with people from different cultures. I think the answer is very carefully to, to understand that people can have vastly different life, life journeys to have come to the same place. Um, I can say that because I myself have lived in four continents in in, I was born in Singapore. I learned English in the UK as a, as a kindergartner. I lived in Singapore for 15 years and I lived in Australia for eight years before coming here. That has really taught me the importance of respecting human dignity, that listening to somebody is critical for understanding and gaining trust and wanting to keep trust. Trust is something that spans cultures. It's a human, it's a human aspiration. So there might be some human commonality that transcends culture itself. Things we all have in common just by virtue of the fact that we're humans, independent of culture. But don't assume that. The whole thing is to earn trust. It's the act of wanting to be trusted. That itself, that, that earnestness of wanting to earn your trust will allow you to span the cultural and I'm really enjoying this conversation and I'd like to continue it but unfortunately we're out of time so we are going to have to wrap I'd like to thank my guests Sam Han and Mei Lin Fung thank you for watching visit our website at www.futuretalk.net for Future Talk I'm Marty Wasserman and we'll see you next time <laughs>